Lovely film. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Trish Rifo. I'm the president of the American Bar Association, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this important panel celebrating the courageous work of human rights lawyer Nasreen Sotudeh of Iran and discussing the state of human rights advocacy today. Nasreen has been called the Nelson Mandela of Iran. Her determined and effective human rights advocacy, particularly on behalf of women and girls, has been met with severe retribution from the Iranian government, including numerous prison sentences following unjust proceedings that contravened international due process standards. Today, she is serving a sentence of 148 lashes and nearly 40 years in prison where she has contracted COVID-19 and her health in general is precarious. In December, the ABA Center for Human Rights was honored to recognize Nasreen's work with the Eleanor Roosevelt Prize for Global Human Rights Achievement. Meanwhile, human rights and the rule of law have been under assault in many other parts of the world. In newer democracies, populist politicians have spurned and exploited majority fears of minority populations, while elsewhere, established authoritarians have tightened their grip on power by strangling protest and silencing opposition leaders. Our guests today will help us appreciate Nasreen's work and will place that work in the broader context of human rights advocacy globally. In the interests of time, I will not recite their formidable uh, professional biographies, which are linked uh, in the materials for your information. They are Agnes Kalmari, Kalmard, excuse me, UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions and director of Columbia University's Global Freedom of Expression Project. Baroness Helena Kennedy, director of the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute. Jeff Kaufman, director, writer, and producer of the new documentary, Nasreen, and who published today in the Washington Post an op-ed about Nasreen. Amir Sultani, human rights activist and author of Zara's Paradise, who is working with Penn America on Nasreen's case, and Robin Wright, writer for The New Yorker, National Magazine Award winner, and former diplomatic correspondent for The Washington Post. I look forward to an excellent conversation with this wonderful panel. But first, we are pleased to show an excerpt of Nasreen's Eleanor Roosevelt Prize Ceremony featuring clips of the documentary Nasreen, as well as her acceptance remarks, which she recorded at home during an all too brief respite from prison. The excerpt will run about 15 minutes, after which the panel will chat and take your questions. When we get to the questions, please be sure to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and not the chat feature. Thank you. Nasreen Sotoudeh is a prominent lawyer in Iran who's been fighting for children's rights, women's rights, and human rights. She is one of the bravest voices in Iran. She took on cases that other lawyers were too afraid to take on. We've seen Nasreen Sotoudeh jailed for defending human rights. And it has cost her and her young family a lot. Protesting against the law which forces Iranian women to wear the hijab. The country's most prominent human rights activists and a voice for the voiceless. I had been in Iran maybe a week and I knew how to toe the line as a woman. And then I meet Nasrin so today who doesn't toe the line at all. <laughs> On Wednesday, Nasreen Satudeh was again arrested. She had been tried and convicted in absentia. According to her husband, 
she intends to continue her activism from prison. دوستان و همکاران گرامی اخیرا مطلع شدم که جایزه مرکز حقوق بشر کانون وکلای آمریکا به من و دو تن از فعالان برجسته علمی و اجتماعی تعلق گرفته است قطعا افتخار بزرگی است که من یکی از برندگان این جایزه باشم و از این بابت مراتب سپاس و قدردانی خود را به رئیس محترم کانون وکلای آمریکا خانوم پاتریشیا لیریفو و رئیس مرکز حقوق بشر این کانون جناب آقای مایکل پیتس تقدیم می دارم. حضور در جمع جامعه وکالت و خانواده بزرگ حقوق بشری برای من افتخار بزرگی است. می خواهم از کانون وکلای آمریکا و مرکز حقوق بشر آن برای بینش، عشق و دوستی که در کارتان وجود دارد به طور ویژه تشکر کنم همچنین مراتب احترام و تبریک خود را خدمت تو دو برنده دیگر این جایزه بیلی جینکینگ و دکتر آنتونی فاوچی تقدیم می دارم این افتخار بزرگی است که نامم در کنار نام شماست این جایزه از چند جهت باعث شادمانی و افتخار من است. قبل از هر چیز مفتخرم که همکارانم در آن سوی دنیا به وضعیت وکلا در ایران توجه دارند. این همبستگی حرفه‌ای که در جایگاهی فراتر از دولت‌هایمان قرار می‌گیرد، چشمانداز‌های روشنتری را برای جامعه مدنی و مفهوم حق و عدالت به همراه می‌آورد. اما این جایزه مفهوم همبستگی تاریخی دیگری را نیز در بطن خود به همراه دارد. مفاهیم مندرش در اعلامی جهانی حقوق بشر که به همت الینور روزویل زنی توانا که به حقوق انسان ها میاندیشیده است به همراه مردانی از سراسر سر جهان که آشنا به حقوق انسان ها بوده اند بنا نهاده شده است. از این بابت و از جست جهت همبستگی زنانه نیز این جایزه به من قدرت و امنیت می بخشد. من بر این باورم مفاهیم مندرش در اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر مفاهیمی است که هر روزه در زندگی شخصی و اجتماعی من با آنها سر و کار داریم و از این رو این اعلامیه مهم است و از این بابت النا روزولد و کمیته تدوین اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر میراث بزرگی برای جامعه بشری به جا گذاشتن که جا دارد به این کار بزرگان ها ادای احترام شود. خانم النا روزولد به عنوان کسی که با جنگ از نزدیک آشنا بوده است برای اجتناب از جنگ برای همیشه جهت تدوین و تصویب اعلامیه حقوق بشر همت به خرج داد او بهتر از هر کسی شاهد این بوده است که چگونه جنگ همه رساوردهای بشری را به تاراج میبرد و غیر از جدایی ابدی خشونت و کشتار انسانها دستاوردهای فرهنگی و اجتماعی را نیز از بین میبرد در چنین بستری و با رشد افراتیگری در سایه جنگ است که کشتار جمعی که در جنگ جهانی دوم شاهد آن بوده این رشد می کند. بدیهی است که شما در شرایط جنگی نمی توانید از حقوق بشر 
حقوق مدنی، سیاسی یا اجتماعی سخن بگویید و این خود زمینه نقض بسیاری از حقوق بنیادین را فراهم می کند. در این حال در آن قانون و در جامعه حقوقی آمریکا زنان دیگری نیز در حال ایجاد هر روزه همبستگی زنانی، زنانه و حرفه‌ای هستند. دوست دارم ادای احترام کنم به خانم روس بیدر گینزبرگ و از اینکه جامعه حقوقی آمریکا چنین قهرمان ادالتی را از دست داده است به شما تسلیت بگویم. گینزبرگ همانطور که خانم پاتریش یا لیری فو گفتند حقوقدان پیشگامی بوده است که در حوزه رفع تبعیض جنسیتی و نژادی بسیار تلاش کرده است. اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر که در مقدمه خود به ضرورت رعایت این حقوق برای حفظ صلح و امنیت جهانی اشاره کرده است و رعایت این حقوق را آرمان مشترک مردم و ملت ها اعلام کرده است بیشک پیامی را به همه دولت ها مخابره کرده است که برای حفظ بقای خود ناچار از رعایت حقوق بنیادین بشر نسبت به تک تک افراد جامعه خود هستند. از این روز که آزادی بشر، عدم تبعیض، منع شکنجه، حق بر زندگی و امنیت شخصی، ممنوعیت بازداشت خود سرانه، استقلال دستگاه غذایی، دادرسی عادلانه و حقوق دیگری که در این اعلامیه ذکر شده است، در جوامعی مثل ما اهمیت پیدا می کند. این اعلامیه مبنای تعامل شهروندان و دولت ها قرار می گیرد و این اعلامیه به فعالان مدنی این امیدواری بزرگ را می دهد که با پیگیری مسالمت آمیز از مسیرهای داخلی و بینان مللی که طی 60 سال گذشته بسیار گسترده شده است می توانند به آرمانهای مشترک بشریت دست پیدا کنند. دوست دارم در اینجا نقل قولی از جان هانفری مدیر بخش حقوق بشر و یکی از نویسندگان مهم پیشنویس اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر بیاورم که گفت اگر اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر رعایت نشود فکر نمی کنم سیاره ما آینده ای داشته باشد ما با استفاده از همین ابزار ابزاری که این اعلامیه سنگ بنای آنها بوده است توانسته ایم در نقاط مختلف جهان فعالیت کنیم و یا از فعالیت های دیگران در شرایط سخت حمایت کنیم. دوست دارم از این فرصت مهم استفاده کنم و از تک تک افرادی تشکر کنم که در سراسر جهان از من و همسرم در زمانی که زندانی بودم و خانوادم تحت فشار هر روزه و تهدید بازداشت قرار داشتن، ما را مورد حمایت بی سابقه ای قرار دادم من با قدردانی از حمایت های ارزشمندتان همواره تاکید می کنم که همه اینها صرفا بابت انجام وظایف حرفه ای هم بوده است با این حال دوست دارم به شما بگویم که حرفم را با همه افتخارات و مخاطراتی که نصیبم کرده است دوست دارم بار دیگر مراتب سپاس و قدردانی خود را به مرکز حقوق بشر کانون و کلای آمریکا تقدیم می دارم و با یادآوری رویاهای مشترکمان بر این باورم که ما می توانیم به سهم خود زمین را به مکانی بهتر برای زیست تبدیل کنیم با تقدیم بهترین احترامات نسرین ستوده ایران تهران دسامبر 2020An extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary video of an extraordinary woman. I think we can all agree that Nasreen Satude is the very best of the legal profession anywhere in the world. And I'm delighted now to turn to our panelists to get some of their thoughts. Um, Jeff, let's, let's start with you and, and begin by congratulating you on your impressive 
documentary. Um, obviously, you had the opportunity to spend uh, time with her. Talk to us about who she is just as a person. What, uh, what makes her tick? Well, if I could first just thank you and everyone with the American Bar Association for hosting this event and, and our colleagues on the panel. All of you represent really what Nazarene is fighting for too, which is the best of civil society and freedom for journalists and artists and, uh, and, and pursuit of, of basic human rights for all people. And I just can't applaud you enough, so thank you. Um, we uh, had the honor of getting to know Nazarene and her uh, equally remarkable husband, Reza Condon, through the making of this documentary. We reached out to them about middle of uh, 2016 at a time that was very contentious and worrisome in American politics. And it was really fascinating to see all these people you saw in, in some of those clips. Think of all those people on, on the steps of the Iranian Bar Association supporting Nazarene in her effort to get her law license back. You know, at times there are like 30 people there in the heart of Tehran, in the heart of the judicial system, and each of them putting themselves at risk uh, for what she stands for. And we see that at the same time where democracy at our country was at the risk of maybe slipping away. Um, one of the things, there's so many things to say about Nazarene, but um, I, I just loved it when she said in that statement, uh, when she received the Eleanor Roosevelt Award, she said, you know, in spite of everything we've gone through, I still love my profession. I still love being a lawyer. You know, she just embraces that idea that the law can bring equality to everybody uh, across borders. And so um, that's been part of our journey and I'm so glad we could be here today. Well, that kind of faith in the power of the law is pretty extraordinary given what she has lived through um, herself and her family. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit, Jeff, about some of the conditions that you encountered in Iran when you were filming this documentary and what did, you know, how you overcame uh, the circumstances there. Well, I'd done a number of films before about human rights around the world and specifically human rights in Iran, and I could not go to Iran to film with Nazarene, but uh, even if I could, um, you know, with my uh, producing partner, Marsha Ross and a crew, uh, it, it wouldn't have been a smart way to do an intimate film. Uh, so what we did instead is we worked with these really uh, courageous uh, filmmakers in Iran who were able to, as you saw, you know, walk with Nazarene down the streets of Tehran, go to a protest, uh, enter an art gallery or a bookstore or even, you know, a theater and have that kind of access. And that was really one of our goals was to show uh, Nazarene as this real inspiring figure, but also um, to break down barriers and misconceptions about Iran. We really wanted to show that um, you know, the, the depth and, and, and the character of the Iranian people uh, is, is not understood in the West and uh, is not a reflection of, of the leadership. Um, so again, uh, we worked with some really remarkable people and some of those have, have not because they did this film, uh, but have paid a price for their activism. Uh, the woman who uh, filmed Nazarene on the courthouse steps with her uh, hands in handcuffs, uh, embracing Naz uh, Reza, uh, she was arrested a few months ago uh, for her democratic activism work. Um, and just I just want to point out that uh, one of the gentlemen that we saw on the Iranian Bar Association steps, Dr. Farhad Mezameh, a remarkable person, uh, was arrested soon after Nazreen was and is now, uh, I believe, uh, has COVID-19 and is in a vain prison. So there are so many people that this film reflects, and we hope that it brings attention to, to all their stories. Well, and so tell us, Jeff, how is the, how's the documentary doing in terms of bringing attention to what's going on um, with Nasreen and, and in Iran in general? Well, I would be remiss to not point out that today is the first day that it's available uh, on Amazon and iTunes and uh, other VOD uh, sources in Canada and the United States. And we hope that you know, everyone who watches this will, uh, you know, will will see it on Amazon or iTunes and write a review and share it with others. Uh, it's really become uh, a gratifying vehicle for amplifying Nazarene's voice uh, and giving her the support and the protection she deserves. One last thing to say is that when I was young, I was deeply inspired by uh, a few people who fought for human rights. It really imprinted something in me. And we hope that 
uh, Nazarene through this film can do the same for others, you know, imprint that sense of responsibility for each other and belief in human rights. Uh, and that's a direct, you know, goal of the film as well. Well, an extraordinary film, and we all look forward to uh, to seeing all of it. Um, I'm getting that dreaded signal that my internet connection is unstable. Um, so hopefully we can uh, power through that, and I apologize if, uh, I, if I disappear. Um, Amir, uh, let's turn to you. You also, of course, know um, Nasreen personally. Tell us, what more can you tell us about who she is as a person? Um. Uh, thank you very much, Trish, and um, uh, what an honor to be on this panel. I know that um, we were working with Nasreen on the Roosevelt speech, um, and I know that she would want to uh, thank uh, Michael Pates and the American Bar Association for this. This, this really did mean the world to her, um, both because it was the American Bar Association and because it was the um, Roosevelt Award. Um, where, um, and I think she would also want to thank the Roosevelt family and Judge Wynn also. Um, you know, uh, I think where one of the things that Mrs. Roosevelt um, always talked about, the question that she raised, a speech she gave 10 years after the passage of the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was, she asked this question, where do human rights begin? And her answer was this, um, you know, she says, where after all do hum universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any map of the world. They, yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory farm or office where he works. Uh, such are the places where every man, woman, and child seek equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Uh, without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for the progress of the larger world. And when I was thinking of um, Nasreen and uh, what she's been doing and going through, and also the film that Jeff and Marsha have made, is that they, Jeff and Marsha, allow us to take a glimpse into an Iranian home and uh, see, see where, where this human rights is coming from. It's not, in a sense, something that's coming from the sky. It's coming from a culture and a tradition. Um, and in, in showing that, in showing the practicality of human rights, in the which, which, and that means a very practical person, the daily aspect of it, um, they kind of show why human rights is so relevant to the life of the Iranian people and why Nasri matters uh, so much to us. Um, you know, there, it's a kind of strange time in Iranian history because so much of the conversation about Iran, and Robin can speak to this a lot better than I, revolves around a, a document called the JCPOA, which is the nuclear agreement. And here we have a woman who is in Garchak prison, which as Jeff notes in his Washington op-ed, is just a, a god awful place. No light, no air, no space, sorry, no, no, no space, very crowded and all of that. And, uh, and she's the person who's breathing life into that other great document of our time, um, which, which, which bears the imprint of Mrs. Roosevelt's spirit, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we have really, you know, at the high, at, both at the simplest and at the highest level, uh, two stories of Iran going on right now. One story that revolves around the film, around Nasreen, and ultimately grounds us in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as what protects the future of Iran. And another which revolves around nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, and all of that stuff, and all the insecurity and tensions around that. And, um, and so I think, I think what, what is extraordinary is that for me as an activist and um, is, is that Nasreen grounds us in that other story. And the film grounds us in that sto other story. And you know, there's a shot in this film where you see Nima, Nasreen's son, outside the prison um, uh, with Nasreen on the other side of the glass and kind of see him waving his lollipop. And, you know, we think of law as this really abstract thing that's in the courts and so on. But ultimately, it's this glass window that has come down with, between a mother and a child. And, you know, that's a universal thing. I mean, a motherhood is a universal thing. Love is a universal thing. And, and I think that 
the reason the film is so precious to us and the reason it's allowed everyone from the European Parliament to Penn, to Miss Magazine, to the American Bar Association, to folks at the Oscars, to our panel here today, it, the reason it allows us to gather around each other is, is quite frankly and simply the fact that we care so deeply around, uh, about Iran. Um, and Nasreen is the symbol of that Iran. I mean, uh, she's referred to as the Mandela of Iran often. And in some ways she's like the Luther of Iran because she represents women's rights in front of an inquisition where women are stripped of their you know, sense of equality. But you know, she's not this firebrand who's trying to destroy a world. She's simply trying to honor the sanctity of human life. And you know, how could we not gather to uh, defend her? And how could we not honor, I mean, somebody who takes 46 days, a 46 day hunger strike for the release of political prisoners in Iran. And they are atheists and monarchists and Baha'i, and, you know, you name it, an eccentric lot. But she, she's breathing life into what Mrs. Roosevelt, what, what Mrs. Mehta, what Rene Kassan, Charles Malik, this extraordinary treasure that was given to us at the end of the Second World War. She's breathing life, life to it in this prison in the middle of nowhere. And so what I love Jeff for and what I love the American Bar Association for is that you are recognizing the significance of what she does and what she means to the Iranian people and quite frankly to people well beyond Iran because this women's rights question and human rights question is in no way the exclusive domain of, uh, of any nation. Amir, speak for a, a minute, if you can, about what you think um, the, the future of um, human rights advocacy in Iran and the, and the future of Iran in the near term, um, how it will be affected by this and by her work. You know, uh, Trish, one of the most, uh, two, two really powerful moments for me was that the Iranian judiciary actually did, with, um, once Nasreen was received, you know, just like a flood of awards, uh, the keys to the city of Florence, um, the Right Livelihood Award, which was introduced by Sweden's foreign minister, declaring a feminist foreign policy, um, the American Bar Association's Roosevelt Award. This, this um, global movement on her behalf um, has deep resonance in Iran. It's got deep resonance with Iran's women's movement. Nashvin doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, this is a torch that Mrs. Ebadi has carried. It's a torch, torch that uh, Iran's Million Women's Movement has carried. And frankly, if you look deeper into Iranian history, it's the torch that Rumi carries. It's the torch that Hafez carries. It's the torch that, you know, the, the Persian language is imbued with a spirit of love and light. It, it may not be framed as law, but it's part of our custom and culture and tradition. It's part of every home. It's part of, you know, you have an American go to Iran today. They won't be shot or killed. They will be fed and uh, taken care of. I mean, hospitality and all that. So, so I think that Nasreen represents, uh, the, as Jeff was saying, that there is this other face to Iranian culture. And, you know, in terms of the impact, you know, you had the... A uh, gentleman who is the sort of head of Iran's Human Rights Commission um, and is the sort of deputy for the international affairs of the Iranian judiciary, his name is Ali Borer Kani, go on the main Iranian, uh, one of Iran's main uh, news channels. And this is what he said, you know, and I'll read the Persian because I think it, it will be, her, what we're doing today will be uh, heard there. And he said, زنان بیش از آن که آمل باشند قربانی آسیب های اجتماعی هستند. طبیعت ذاتی و سرشت خلقت زنان اختزا می کند که نباید زندان نخستین گزینه مجازات برای کسانی باشد که می توانند موثرترین عامل تربیت و نگهبان سلامت روحی روانی و جسمانی خانواده و جامعه باشند. Which, um, which translates to women are not the agents, but the, and this is what he told Nasreen. He said, women are not the agents, but the victims of societal harm. The nature and essence of women's creation demands that prison should not be our first resort um, for, holding, for holding people who can be the most effective agents for education and guardians of the spirit, psychological and physical health of their family and society. So, you know, it's clear that the Iranian judiciary is hearing us. 
Four million Iranians came out to oppose the um, execution of Iranian protesters on Instagram. So this notion that there isn't a culture of human rights in Iran, or that you know Iranian society is somehow dormant and just the victims of human rights violations is actually incorrect. There's a lot of agency and, um, and Nasreen would be the first to say that she's not the only person who's uh, pushing for human rights. Right, thank you, Amir. Um, we, we hope that this program can contribute um, to, to moving these issues forward uh, in Iran. And Agnes, let me, let me turn to you next because you have um, a, a global vantage point for sure. And I wonder if you might give us your sense of the state of human rights advocacy uh, in the world today? Do we, are we looking at a dark time coming or an even darker time? Or are you beginning to see light emerging here and there? Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this event. It's a great, um, great honor uh, to be joining you all in the celebration of uh, Nazrin's work and life and what she represents for us all. Um, in terms of your question, while I, I think that from an advocacy standpoint, we're going to see remarkable um, people and remarkable movement, in terms of the overall environment, we need to acknowledge that the um, structural systemic forces uh, at this point in time of the 21st century are not amenable to um, human rights protection. And what do I mean here? If you look at the, the, the long-term uh, conditions of the world, we are facing a, a climate crisis which has huge implications for human rights, huge, uh, and is existentialist in its nature. We're confronting the restructuring of the global international system where the existing superpower, or until now superpower of the United States is facing real challenge from China uh, and at a lesser level, but still there from Russia. That's creating huge instability and that is absolutely not conducive to uh, a strengthening of, um, of human rights. Adding to that pot, we now have a pandemic, which um, you know, we are all hoping will be over and done with by, by the end of the 2021. Uh, but you know, every time I personally open my radio or the television, all I hear is about a new, uh, a new form of COVID-19 emerging. Um, so basically, we don't, you know, while we're hoping, um, what we do know is that pandemics may become part and parcel of our environment. And based on what has happened in 2020, that too we know is a force for bad in terms of how human rights are being uh, shrink, are shrunk uh, in the name of uh, some emergency, uh, health emergency procedures, which in fact are not even delivering, um, delivering health. Um, you know, so I'm just giving you here some of the long-term uh, conditions of the world. I'm not talking about um, demographics and the fact that we are having a, an extraordinarily large young population that happen to be located in the part of the world that is the poorest um, and uh, an, an aging population um, in the north. I mean, all of those factors in my, in my view mean that from a human rights standpoint, A, it cannot be business as usual. We are looking at very dark days ahead. Uh, B, it means that we need to be more courageous and bolder and to look for Nasrin as an example of what we need to become in order to confront uh, the challenges ahead. We need to be prepared to be um, creative, bold and forceful in the movements we're gonna establish, in the coalition that we're gonna create, in the way we're gonna rebel, uh, rebel against um, governments um, that are using those trends to enforce an autocratic uh, regime. So the forces, the systemic um, uh, element of the world are not for and pro 
uh, human rights. They are quite the opposite. But what we have seen in 2020, what we have seen in previous years, in fact, but particularly in 2020, is people's courage, people's resilience, and people's commitment to tackle systemic forces such as racism and, and, um, and sexual uh, and gender inequality. So I am hopeful that the human um, spirit, the human conscience, and you know, people like Nasrin are gonna lead us into building the human rights movement that will be needed to fight back and to protect uh, our dignity in this uh, very tough world. Well, I think we all choose to share your optimism because the alternative is um, sort of is too dark, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. We, we don't have a choice. That the we human don't have a choice. takes us all forward and, and ultimately prevails. So um, Agnes, as a, as a practical matter, to what extent has the UN system been supportive of human rights defenders, either as a bulwark against further retribution or um, as a means to facilitate their advocacy. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure, but, I mean, um, I, I, I think that like civil society, the, the UN to a large extent did rise to the challenge of protecting human rights defenders, of understanding that those actors are the avenues, are the forces through which we are going to be uh, better and we are going to be able to um, protect uh, human rights. So investing in the protection of human rights defenders is understood, I think, throughout the UN system as investing into a better world, investing into a world that is going to implement the sustainable development goal. It's investing into a world that is gonna be prepared to challenge climate change. It's investing into a world that will ensure stronger equality. It's investing into a world that will protect uh, the most vulnerable at a time of pandemics. It's investing into a world that will protect children um, as uh, Nasrin did. So I think that is very much at the heart, I will say of, the UN, um, you know, the way the UN has evolved, particularly since the adoption of the Declaration for uh, Human Rights Defenders. And as a, a special rapporteur, I'm, I'm uh, one of about um, 50 uh, other uh, individuals or working group, I think every single one of us has placed human rights defenders, you know, at the center or near the center of the work that we do. Thank you. Um, Baroness, let's, uh, let's turn to you. Let's talk about um, non-governmental organizations. Um, you know, your, your bar association and, and mine, uh, how do you see uh, Nasreen's work um, as both sort of inspiration and practical lessons for those of us who um, are, are working in NGOs in this space? Well, I don't think of, 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 uh, of bar associations as NGOs and the American Bar Association is more than that. It's a professional organization and the professional home of American lawyers. And, uh, and the Bar Council in the United Kingdom is that too. Um, I uh, am a practicing barrister in uh, the United Kingdom, but I'm also um, the, the director of the International Bar Association's Institute of Human Rights. And, uh, and we've been engaged with the whole issue of Iran and uh, lawyers in Iran uh, for many, many years. And uh, Nazrin is one of the, the great figures and uh, uh, we hold her very close to our hearts. And we, and I personally have done work over many years um, with Erwin, Erwin Kotler and, and other lawyers um, about the situation that, uh, that uh, uh, Nazrin has faced with such courage. And, and we, you see it from the film, what a remarkable, um, iconic woman she is. And, uh, and the message to us is, 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 is a reminder that um, as lawyers, we, we are the people who have to safeguard the rule of law. And we do so within our own nations, but we have to do it internationally too. And we have to be the people who protect uh, lawyers at risk in other countries because of the vital role that, that courageous people like Nazrin play 
in trying to keep the flag flying for the rule of law in places where it's not being, it's not happening. And I, and I was interested in one of the things that Amir said. He spoke about the culture of, 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 of Iranians and, and of the Persian people. And it's absolutely true, a people who, who, whose poetry speaks uh, uh, volumes about the humanity of, of their culture, the way in which as people, they have created such beauty and believe so much in, uh, in uh, the importance of the relationships of ma men and women and caring for each other and the importance of love in their society. And it's true that it wouldn't matter whether you're an American or British and we don't have a good, uh, uh, as Brit the British uh, don't have a very good uh, record in uh, Iran, I can tell you, um, because of the overthrow back in 1953 of, of, uh, of the government then, the democratically elected government. Um, we played a, a, a terrible part in that, but I have never ever found such welcoming people. And I would say this, do you know that back in the sixth century BC, um, Cyrus was the, the emperor at the time. And there remains an artifact and it's in the British Museum and it's called the Cyrus Cylinder. And I've sometimes maintained that it's the earliest human rights artifact because in the, the very ancient script on that cylinder are, is rep, are, are references to the need always and the rule that there must be that if there is conflict and there is war, that you have to protect prisoners of war. You must not kill prisoners of war and that you must not prevent them practicing their religion, though very different from yours. And, and that is inscribed into that cylinder. And I think, I don't know whether there's anything older, I don't believe there is, talking about the humanity with which you must deal with the other, even if you disagree with them. And so um, this is a, a nation that has a rich background. And, uh, and as far as lawyers are concerned, let me just tell you, there are, there are a number of bar associations throughout Iran and the often members will come to uh, the International Bar Association's conferences. And um, I, one of the remarkable things that we at the International Bar Association took a stand over was that last year, um, there was a, a bill being introduced and it was basically a sort of takeover they didn't like these, there's, there's some local bars and there's a big central bar in Tehran and it's got 20,000 lawyers as members. And, uh, and they often try to do things about stuff like Nazrin. And um, the, uh, the, the powers that be want to uh, end it. And they've brought in a bill um, which was uh, to allow the Iranian, well, first of all, they brought in a bill um, in the middle of, uh, of, of, it was going through parliament back May, in May of last year, and it was basically to introduce a new bar association, but a government run bar association, not an independent one. 12,000 lawyers took to the streets and demonstrated against that bill. So don't think that, they, that, that the independence of lawyers is, is a rollover. There, there, there's a level of resistance not you know they, it's, they're frightened but they but but 12,000 took to the streets in December the response of the government was then to introduce this sort of arbitrary thing which is uh, they're going to uh, allow the judiciary to uh, the Iranian judiciary will be able to control uh, lawyers through disciplinary action directly from the bench so that they can say to prison and uh, and so again, there is a great deal of action now being taken and, and requests for help from outside. And we at the International Bar Association have tried with intervention letters and so forth. So what do I say? I say that the film that started this tonight's uh, uh, discussion um, from the American Bar Association's Human Rights Center is inspirational because of what it's saying to lawyers, and it doesn't matter whether you're a commercial lawyer, a lawyer working in immigration, in mergers and acquisition, whatever it is you're doing, whether you're a human rights lawyer who, who de de decides that that's, you know, describes themselves as such, or whether you're a lawyer who does family law, it doesn't matter. As lawyers, we owe it to each other to make sure, and we owe it to the world to protect the rule of law, to protect human rights and to protect 
the lawyers who are doing these things in dangerous places. We have to have, we, ha we have to give the support that is needed. And so I, I would just say that um, uh, uh, bar associations sometimes are captured by the state. Sometimes they have to work quietly trying to preserve some level of independence. Um, and other times they are, they do make a stand. In Pakistan, for example, and a number of years ago when Musharraf was in, it was the, a, uh, in control, um, he uh, had the chief justice put under house arrest because he didn't like his decisions. And the bar took to the streets. And so, you know, we as lawyers, whatever our field of expertise, have to stand up for human rights and the rule of law. And the great um, respect I have, uh, Trish, for the American Bar Association and the Human Rights Center, which Michael runs, is that, is that I, I really do see the, the, you often taking very bold stance, stances on this kind of thing. And it's, it's wonderful because it's important to hear the voice of American lawyers on these issues. And the, um, the International Bar Association of which you are a part and, 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 and it's an important that you are, is that the International Bar Association also does that and really has to be heard. Our voices of thousands of lawyers around the world, you know, hundreds and, uh, you know, 188 uh, uh, bar associations around the world are, are under our umbrella, but we have to sometimes push them hard and say to bar associations, you have a responsibility to protect those uh, who are in your fold and who are speaking for the powerless in your own society. Well, absolutely. And I think, Baroness, that's why you and I love bar association work is because the lawyers who, um, who you work with and the lawyers I get to work with are precisely the kinds of people you describe, even if their personal um, expertise has nothing to do with these big, larger global issues, um, mm -hmm. lawyers care and, and lawyers come together to do uh, this kind of work because they believe in higher principles around the rule of law injustice uh, and the like. And that's that's why I'm here. And I bet that's why you're as involved in the IBA as you are. Yeah. Um, Robin, you know, you, you have the curse of having a last name that starts with a W. So forgive me for going in alphabetical order uh, and getting to you last. But um, you have such a depth of experience in um, <laughs> in all things, um, foreign and, and diplomatic. Can you just just maybe give us some reflections on the conversation that, that you've heard so far today. Uh, well, I've always been inspired uh, by those who are brave enough in Iran to take bold action to challenge the regime. Uh, I've been traveling to Iran since 1973. I don't go back quite as far as Cyrus, but almost. And one of the things I was going to pick up on both Amir and the Baroness is that the, the Cy Cyrus was so important in defining the first bold action on human rights. I've seen that little Cyrus cylinder, the size of a rugby ball. Mm -hmm. And it says in tiny cuneiform writing in Cyrus's voice that power comes from the people and no leader is legitimate unless he has the support of his people. This is the founding principle of human rights and sharing power. And uh, there are many in the human rights community who look at Cyrus as, you know, as defining on the human rights agenda globally as the Magna Carta, the US Constitution. This was such an important time at the time that, that, that the Persian Empire was the largest entity in the first great empire on earth. Um, having been in South Africa when in, for the first up, uprising in 1976, I was in Soweto, and having gone back to watch Nelson Mandela uh, walk to freedom and, and then interviewing him, the thing that is so striking is that it takes people, it takes the bravery of individuals to defy the system, to stand up to power. Uh, and this is where Nazarene who is this tiny, sweet little thing, she's so tiny, has been so powerful in her in projecting her voice and standing up for those less privileged. I have been to Tehran, I interviewed her and met Reza uh, when I was there. I've written about her in the New Yorker and, and for the Washington Post extensively. And I feel for the impact she makes. As we've learned in so many different parts of the world, it takes time for the human rights activists. And it takes the support of the international community to make a difference. And let me just say that we have a real uh, challenge moving forward. 
on the JCPOA, this historic nuclear deal agreed to by the world's six major powers with Iran in 2015. As Joe Biden decides whether to go back and how to go back, one of the big issues that will intersect with this is human rights and the freedom of Nazarene Satude and the dissidents, thousands of whom have been, tens of thousands of whom have been arrested in Iran over the years. And the Americans, the dual nationals who are held in Iran today will uh, become, I think, an issue. And does Biden say we're not gonna make any progress on the nuclear deal or even talk to Iran until these people are freed? And it is going to be the devil's argument of, uh, which takes priority and what do you do? For all of us who know Nazreen and the other dissidents in Iran, I have several friends who are in Evan prison uh, or have been done long stints in Evan prison. The, we want them out. And uh, Jeff today had a piece on Nazreen, but Jason Razahian, a former American, former Washington or current Washington Post correspondent who spent I think 544 days in Evan prison have said the, the US should do no, no negotiations, no diplomacy with Iran until everyone is freed. And there are some really tough choices ahead. And just let me put it in a wider context, having written many books about this place and followed it for so long. The debate about in the revolution that has played out since 1979 is, is Iran the Islamic Republic of Iran first and foremost Islamic, or is it first and foremost a republic? Its constitution is based on French and Belgian law with a parallel structure that created institutions with Islamic clerics as a check and balance on the political, those who were elected, so that there would be no recreation of the monarchy or no recreation of a strong man. But as we know, the clerics have won. The bit debate today still plays out. Is man's law superior or God's law superior? And this is where Nazarene has been one of those people saying, man's law, you know, respect for human rights and the kind of principles that Cyrus put on the table so many centuries ago are what should decide a human being's fate. And uh, so, you know, I just wanted to end with a little note of caution. We all nobly fight for uh, Nazarene and the others. The problem is if there's no progress on diplomacy and the nuclear deal, the danger is there will be more people arrested. There will be more pressure on the dissidents and the opponents and the activists uh, in Iran. And the problem is we, we can get into a cycle where, we, we, where nothing, no progress is made and we get back to that moment where people are again talking about war. And, and trust me, having covered the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, any war with Iran would be more calamitous, more costly in human life and treasury to than Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Um, so, you know, this is all by way of saying, let's pay attention to this issue. Let's give them as much support as we can. Let's also understand the broader stakes and, and the tough decisions ahead for everybody, including a new administration. Absolutely. They have a lot of uh, tough decisions lying ahead of them, this being one set of them, right? Um, so we're getting a number of questions from our audience that I'm going to uh, get to in a minute, one of which is around, Robin, something you just touched on, which is sort of a what can I do to help question. So um, I'm going to ask you all to reflect on that for a moment while we, um, we bring in a, a very special guest. We are delighted and honored to have with us um, Reza Kandan who is um, her husband. And we are delighted to have him here with us. Um, Amir, um, can you please um, welcome him and ask him what he can tell us about her condition now? رضا جان خیلی مفتخرم که شما تشریف آوردین و سوال اینه که حال نسرین الان چطوره؟ بله من سلام می کنم خدمت همه دوستان و تشکر ویژه دارم از ABA کانون وکلای آمریکا برای ترتیب دادن این پنل و همه دوستانی که دارن برنامه رو می بینم می دونید که روز چهارشنبه نسرین بعد از چند روز بستری شدن توی بیمارستان برگشت به زندان قرچک 
و الان زندان قرشک ما دیروز تونستیم اونو روز دوشنبه ملاقات کنیم توی زندان و صبح همون روز نسرین اعزام شده بود برای پزشکی قانونی به خاطر عمل آنجیو و مشکلات جسمی که داره اونجا هم تونستیم نسرین رو ببینیم و کمیسیونی تشکیل شده بود تا تصمیم بگیرم ببینن که وضعیت جسمی نسرین چجوری آیا میتونه تو این شرایط تو زندان باقی بمونه یا نه ممکنه تا یه هفته یه دیگه جواب بدن Uh, thank you very much for your very kind in introduction. Um, uh, I'm most grateful to the ABA for hosting this uh, event. Um, as you know, uh, we had to take Nasreen back to the, Nasreen's back in prison. Uh, she's gone back to Rajshak prison. Um, I uh, saw her on uh, Monday uh, morning where she had to, uh, she's had an angio operation, angio procedure on her heart. Um, Uh, she was taken to see the sort of medical authority so that a committee can decide whether it's safe for her to be in prison or not, where she can be back in. The Zendan Budan and Nasrin or Azad Budan is a very important part of the physical and physical physical law. It's more of a political and political law that the government or the government باید بگیرن و تصمیم بگیرن که ایشون تو زندان بمونه یا نه وگرنه خیلی تصمیم پزشکی نیست از نظر پزشکان معلومه که اصلا شرایط زندان شرایطی نیست که کسی با وضعیت نسرین بخواد اونجا بمونه uh, Of course I should add that the decision uh, that's being made is really not so much a medical decision because from a, a medical standpoint uh, to all the doctors it's obvious that she should absolutely not be in the hospital Uh, it really comes down to the fact that it is a judicial or a, and political decision that's being made about her. Well, که خیلی برای ما اهمیت داره من اینم اضافه کنم اونم اینه که چه نسرین تو زندان قرشک بمونه چه آزاد بشه از اونجا یا حتی منتقل بشه این دلیل بر این نمیشه که موضوع زندان قرشک از افکار عمومی دور بشه زندان قرشک یک فاجعه است به تنهایی برای خودش اتفاق مثبتی که افتاد اینه که بودن نسرین اونجا باعث میشه که این زندان بیشتر تو خبرها باشه و شرایط اونجا بیشتر گفته بشه تا بلکه نجاتی باشه برای دهها و هزاران زنی که در طول سالیان اونجا محبوس هستند و در شرایط کاملا غیر انسانی اونجا قرار گرفتند Uh, of course, I should add that whether Nasrin is in or out the prison really uh, isn't the issue. Um, the truth of it is that Arshak prison is an absolute calamity. Uh, Jeff, by the way, has mentioned this in his Washington Post piece. Arshak prison is a calamity. And uh, the good thing about her being there is that it exposes the horrible conditions in that prison. Um, and. Uh, And uh, which is a prison where tens to thousands of women, in which tens to thousands of women are uh, being held. And uh, just parenthetically, I should add that uh, one of my friends from elementary school in Iran is also in that prison. Her name is Marjan Dovary and is in the same cell as uh, uh, Nasri. Well, thank you, Amir. Please ask him to convey uh, on behalf of the American Bar Association and our audience Our, our deepest best wishes uh, and support and solidarity um, to Nasreen. Reza Jan, very much thank you for your support and from your personal and from the Bar Association of America and from all the people who are in this program. I would like to thank you for your support and your support to Nasreen. Thank you very much, I thank you very much. خیلی ممنونم منم تشکر می کنم حتما پیغام پرمهرتون رو به نسرین خواهم رسوند و نسرین هم خیلی خوشحال خواهد بود I'll be sure to pass on your very kind message and I can tell you that Nasrin will be delighted to hear from you Thank you, thank you so much um, So let me ask our panelists to, um, to reflect on the question that I asked before uh, we, we took that wonderful um, moment with her husband What can I do? Um, if I am uh, an audience member watching today to make a difference 
uh, on these topics. If I can um, pick up on where um, Robin left things, uh, Robin was talking about uh, the experience, the South African experience, and how long it took um, for Mandela to be released from prison. And one, one, I mean, there are two things that are very important about the South Africa analogy. Uh, Jeff's piece was also referred to Nasrin as Iran's Mandela. What, what that Iran's Mandela. You know, imagine that. Uh, imagine an American administration that was dealing with South Africa um, at the time Mandela was in prison and speaking exclusively about uh, you know South Africa's nuclear arsenal and not looking to the broader questions that Mandela had raised by being in prison for the period that he was in, and and not looking at the question of discrimination. I mean, racial discrimination there gender discrimination in Iran. But the parallels are really stunning. And if I could just sort of piggyback on what Robin was saying, uh, neither Reagan nor Thatcher were particularly um, supportive of, the, um, of Mandela or for the push for change. What brought about the change was this vast grassroots effort in both America and in England and really the rest of the world where people who cared um, really banged on the drums, the NAACP, Ron Dellums in Congress, really championed human rights. So I think what, I, what my message to our audience would be is that uh, we, need to, we need to be in this for the long haul and we need to let our um, representatives know that this is something that matters to me. It's what's so extraordinarily heartening on the Iran issue. You know, there's Mrs. Roosevelt hovering above us but then, you know, Mrs. Clinton's work on behalf of women's equality and freedom, uh, Carrie Kennedy and Gloria Steinem had an extraordinarily extraordinary op-ed uh, in the Boston Globe where they pretty much said what Robin was saying that, you know, uh, women first. And I think that, you know, as an activist, that's what I've been saying, you know, Swedish foreign minister, women first. Um, and, you know, women are half the world. And I think this goes to what Agnes is saying that we're, you know, half of all this authoritarianism stuff is this grotesque machismo. And it's being absorbed and challenged by women everywhere. That's half the world on our side, you know? Plus, I would say at least half the men in the world are also on our side because we're sons and brothers to sisters and stuff. So really this movement potential, I call it Operation Avalanche, is enormous. But each one of us can, has to take the pebble up some mountain and let it go. Jeff, you look like you wanted to say a word. Well, sure. I, I just I support everything that everyone else has said. Um, uh, Chuck Schumer said about the agenda before the Senate, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think that can happen uh, with our, um, our policy with Iran as well. Uh, pursuing uh, getting back into the nuclear accord with Iran uh, does not mean we can't pursue human rights at the same time. We don't have to choose one over the other. And the two, frankly, can reinforce each other. Uh, and and um, I think having more at stake with each other will lift both of those boats at the same time. Uh, and you know we've seen I think over the last four years uh, uh, politicians with crocodile tears about human rights in Iran when they didn't really care about uh, the people they're talking about. They just wanted to have conflict with Iran and they would use that as a prop. So uh, I think uh, a real avenue of discussion and moving things forward will lift both boats at the same time. And just to connect to one more piece, which is that uh, it's true, uh, that grassroots effort um, where we see people um, join their voices together is what gives the politicians the strength and the vision uh, to, to find some common ground. And so it's top down, but it's really, really bottom up and the two together, especially through the law, is an absolutely essential process. You can find out more about uh, groups that are um, doing this kind of work through our website and also find out more about Nazarene. I'll just give you that website. It's www.nazarenefilm.com. Uh, and we just want that to be a tool for communication and also that grassroots effort. And, and thank I you. I want to say some, I want to say something here. This is, an, this is an event that's been organized um, by the American Bar Association. And, uh, and, and many of the people who are listening, I'm sure, are lawyers. And I want to say that uh, there's, a, there's always a problem for bar associations. 
um, even bar associations in the United States of America or in Britain, which is that the institutions, which are professional organizations, um, often feel that the, the important position they have to take is to be neutral, that they mustn't be, take political sides. And I have to say that that can often be an excuse for failing to step forward when it comes to the rule of law, for failing to dig a stand when something as important as, as breaches and dismissal of the rule of law is taking place and abuses of human rights. And as lawyers, it doesn't matter what your political party, whether, what, how you describe yourself politically, whether you were right or left or whatever, standing up for the protection of the rule of law is fundamental. And you have to do it at home as well as abroad because you have the, the, the if you like, the moral high ground to do it abroad if you're doing it at home. So I'm saying to everybody who's listening tonight, the rule of law matters in our world. The, the, the efforts that were made after the Second World War and the horrors of the Holocaust were to bring together people around a rules-based order in the world to which we all signed up. We have to protect that as lawyers, every single one of us. And being silent makes you complicit in the destruction of the rule of law. So I'm saying to every lawyer here today, it doesn't matter what area you practice in, it doesn't matter what your politics are, your commitment to the rule of law and your professional duties to protect it have to come first. You can, and you can start with a small thing by sharing Jeff's wonderful op-ed today with people who don't know this story. Robin, I'm gonna let you close us out because uh, unfortunately we're, we're out of time. So let me just pick up on what Jeff said. And I think it's very important. Uh, yes, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. The problem is that those who are opposed to uh, reviving diplomacy with Iran, re uh, re-engaging on the nuclear deal, will exploit human rights for their own uh, game, for their own game to block diplomacy. It has nothing to do with their appreciation of human rights. It will be in many ways against the whole principle of human rights. Uh, this is trying to, you know, to engage in actions or encourage uh, policy that will uh, uproot the regime. And that, frankly, we don't have the power to do. That's something that should be up to the Iranian people to decide, not for us. Uh, and so I, you know, I encourage, because I'm a member of the press, I have, uh, I don't take sides, uh, but I do write about those issues that matter. And I think Jeff has done an extraordinary job in giving voice to Nazreen, making her better known around the world, and also, um, you know, writing about her. I mean, get out there and write about uh, these noble characters who capture not just their own plight, but the plight of a of all the activists around them. Um, I just can't tell you how terrific this program has been. I am so grateful to every single one of you for your contributions. Um, you are each remarkable in your own right. And I wish we had more time just to hear from, uh, from each one of you because um, you're all in very different ways, um, extraordinary examples of um, what's good in our world. And we're just deeply grateful to each of you uh, and particularly grateful to Reza. So on behalf of the American Bar Association, thank you for joining us today and carry the message forward. خیلی تشکر کردن رضا جان از تمام حوزه‌های محترم به خصوص شما متاسفم که وقت بیشتری برای پنل امروز نیست و متشکرتون. And uh, thank you, thank you so much. And if I may, I just wanted to slip in a, a quote I came across from Khomeini. Uh, I was just reading it last night and he said, women are creatures that can destroy a power that seems everlasting, a demonic power. So it's uh, <laughs> one of his uh, famous- Oh, uh, wonderful. Quotes. I'm going to cherish my demonic power. <laughs> a great final word. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.